Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. I know, I said I was going to take a break from video essays for a while, but it turns out I've had something bottled up inside of me that needs to get out, and God damn it, I'm going to let it out. This is the time of year in which it's going to come out. So first, I'm going to take us back 20 years. That's right, 20 years to a time when I was but a wee 12 year old girl, and all the girls in my class were raving about a new romance film that had just come out called Love Actually, and it was starring three of my all time favourite heartthrobs at the time actually, to be fair, still the same, which would be Hugh Grant, Colin Firth and Alan Rickman. God bless his soul. Now, I was still one of those dorky nerds who watched cartoons 98% of the time primarily, so films starring real life people was classified as high art in my eyes. So, dare I say, seeing such a film would be quite grown up. So there was a class mission to all go to the cinema that Saturday to watch Love Actually, which was saucy stuff for 12 year old girls at the time because that film was rated 15 plus and does contain nudity. So as you can imagine, all of us thought we were basically breaking the law by going to see it. Um, though I came from quite a strict household and mother wouldn't allow me to go see it. So I remained inside that weekend and I sat sulkily at my desk on Monday morning when everyone but I discussed one of the greatest romance films they'd ever seen, which wasn't much considering they were 12 year old girls. Now thanks to the fleetingness of teenage interests, the topic became irrelevant within a week or two, and then years passed and I forgot all about Love Actually and the craze it caused at school until nearly a full decade later. Now I was now an undergraduate at university, and a group of students from my halls decided to put on a screening of Love Actually in the common room. Now curious, and very much interested in a guy there at the time who I knew for a fact would be going to see it, I decided to attend the screening. And this is the rant that's been sitting in my soul for more than a decade. <laughs> So I'm sure most of you know the plot of Love Actually, but for clarity's sake, let me give an overview and then we'll go into depth in each story and why each one has a problem, in my opinion. Oh, well, most. Let's get into it. So Love Actually is a British rom-com by the beloved director Richard Curtis, whose works I genuinely really enjoy. You know, particularly Bridget Jones's Diary, Notting Hill, Four Weddings and a Funeral, but major massive shout out primarily to Blackadder because peak television in my opinion. Okay, so first off, the film scope is one of the biggest red flags immediately. We don't have one, two, three, four, but ten stories, technically, nine of them romantic, or rather about love, within the span of a 136 minute film. Which, in my opinion, is asking for trouble, especially when we are looking at two of the most complex topics known to humanity human relationships and love. And thank God it's only 10, because apparently Curtis originally wanted to, there to be 14 stories, so goodness knows what toxicity would have spewed from that dynamic. So the main plot lines are Billy Mac and Joe. Now this, is, I'm not gonna talk about this. He's a house been singer and his manager, that relationship. Then we have a newlywed couple, Juliet and Peter, and Peter's supposed best friend, Mark. Sarah, her brother, Michael, and her office crush, Carl. David, the Prime Minister, and his new assistant, Natalie, husband and wife, Harry and Karen, and the affair partner, Mia, best friends, Colin and Tony, and a group of American girls, Sam, Joanna, his classmate, Crush, and his stepfather, Daniel, John and Judy, two body doubles who dry hump each other for a living for a film, and finally, Jamie and Aurelia, and Jamie's brother, who ends up sleeping with Jamie's wife. And then finally, Rufus, dear old Rufus, played by Rowan Atkinson, who just sneaks into the stories here and there as kind of like a Christmas angel casting his magic and kind of making the plot go in the sympathetic character's way. So me saying all of that right now was quite a bit of a headache, and I can't imagine how that was to plot out in a script of only a 136 minute film. I cannot stress that enough. But clearly, Curtis liked a challenge and wanted to do something new, and it's been a popular format since. We have seen Valentine's Day ones, Thanksgiving versions of this film, you know, of many multiple stories interconnecting in some way. So let's give credit where credit is due. Curtis does an excellent job in connecting all of these stories and their interloping characters. They're all related in some way. The interconnected structure of the story is very clever, but in my opinion, the film's scope in such a short time span came at a great cost. It creates what I will argue 
as a melting pot of underdeveloped, depressively weak love stories which lack any emotional depth or spirit, and which ultimately promote a notion of romance which is predominantly self-serving, riddled with quite a few red flags and inappropriate power dynamics, all topped off with very tacky humour that's not at all witty, which isn't really cut as a style. He's normally quite witty. I mean, Blackadder. Oh, that felt good to just get off my chest. And no, before all the critics come saying that I'm projecting a contemporary post-Me Too analysis onto a film that is technically of its time, no. Well, firstly, I had these views over a decade ago, long before Me Too was even a thing, really, even though the, the issues have always been a thing. But then secondly, many others criticised the film at the time for the issues that I now have with it. So 20 years ago is not that long ago. And there are films that are 50 plus years old that still stand the test of time, regardless of contemporary theoretical approaches and morality discussions. Good films are good films. Good love stories are good love stories. This film has lauded as a champion of both of them. And I'm here to shatter the conceptualization for my own selfish need to have a rant about it. But I'm not here to convince you otherwise. If you like the film, then continue to watch it. I'm just here solely for catharsis. So, this is going to be a long video. Before we deep dive into this rant, let me take a good second to thank today's sponsor for making this catharsis possible, Squarespace. So, I've built all my main business websites over the past few years with Squarespace, including my lovely current Lady of the Library one, which is where I blog around with all my little thoughts and details, and it's going to expand into more bookish discussions there, as well as personal development stuff. Now, I love Squarespace for how intuitive and easy it makes website design and layout. You know, I don't know anything about coding, which has made, you know, other website platforms so frustrating and just impossible to use. But with Squarespace, I can just simply drag and drop my content where I want it. And also, if you're a creator like me and you want to expand your revenue stream in the new year, then Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that makes it so easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. You know, Squarespace member area lets you sell courses. So if you're an artist or a personal trainer or, you know, a creator in some way, you can sell those courses to your followers and you can sell it to them because Squarespace has an inbuilt email campaign option where you can collect email subscribers and convert them into loyal customers from just reading your blog or from your website. And the built-in analytics feature gives you insight into who's visiting your site, the traffic sources, the time they spend there, the most read and popular content, their geography, and so much more. So why don't you expand your business in the new year and build a beautiful website with Squarespace? Go to squarespace.com forward slash for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So I'm going in no particular order, uh, but I'll be covering each of the couples as a whole to streamline my analysis, starting with the one that is probably the most prominent in terms of my dislike, yet features the greatest of actors. So that's why they're taking first sound. We have Harry, played by the magnificent Alan Rickman, God rest his soul, and Karen, who is played by the ultimate muse of my young acting career, Emma Thompson. What an acting powerhouse. Can we just take acknowledgement here? These two are magnificent together. So Harry is an agency director and he's planning an office Christmas party with his young, attractive secretary, Mia. Obviously, the two then start having an affair whilst his stay-at-home devoted wife, Karen, cares for their family and her newly widowed friend, Daniel, who's taking care of his young stepson, Sam. We'll come back to them later. Okay, so putting aside for now the scum drudgery of Harry's affair, we have to address the element in the room of the power imbalance between himself as the director of the company and his young secretary, which is an issue even if he weren't a married man. Now, I am talking about this and you're probably thinking, Chinsia, this isn't a romance that we should be analysing because we're meant to dislike it from the audience perspective. However, the dynamics at play here is relevant for a romance that is later in the film that we are rooting for and the similarities are uncanny. So I'm going to discuss the power balance here. Now, anyone who's on the internet in 2022 will have heard of a similar situation between Harry and Mia playing out in the real world. Ned Fulmer from the Try Guys, who cheated on his wife and the mother of his children with one of his younger employees, which resulted in him being removed from the company and kind of off the face of the planet and all, honestly, no one knows what happened to them. The fallout was massive, with SNL even making a distasteful sketch about the situation where they mocked a man's life for being professionally ruined over something as trivial as an affair. The problem with, with this narrative is that the immensity of the circumstances was not that he had an affair, 
it was that he had an affair with an employee. When Ned released a public statement addressing his affair, one of the details that became the subject of conversation was his phrase, consensual workplace relationship. Of course, Ned and his employee consented to their relationship, but it certainly wasn't done so on equal footing, considering the inherent power dynamic at play. He was her boss, she was his employee. Everyone knows there are different levels in workplace environments, and anyone who has worked in a company knows that there are people who, with whom you can casually chat, and those that you can't. This is all because of a power system being in place, even though it's not notable to most people on a conscious level. This power system takes many forms, and most of them are incredibly subtle. It's not just job titles here. For an example, an office room with a door is a power structure. You as an employee can walk into the staff room, but you can't just walk into someone's office without knocking or getting their permission. Now, you may not think of that as a power structure, but that is. Higher ups in a company have more physical and systemic socio-economic barriers between themselves and those working for them. And when a higher up shows interest in someone below them, this creates a metaphorical ladder that creates an advantage for the person at the bottom of it. So whether that's favoritism in a workplace or having an office affair, we are socially programmed to be attracted to someone with more power than us. And when a person with more power lowers the ladder down to our level in some kind of capacity, we are enticed to climb up it. Now, this is not me saying that everyone fancies their bosses or fancies people in power, nor am I saying that it's impossible to have an entirely platonic relationship between people in senior positions and those below them. However, what I am saying is that if Harry ever gave Mia a hint of attraction, such as a wink, a raised eyebrow, or a flirty remark, which is very likely considering how, as we shall see later in the example of Sarah, he as her boss has zero personal boundaries with his employees and is uncomfortable talking about their love lives and their sex lives with them in the company setting, well then, Mia is in a bit of a difficult position. You see, when the person in a position of power makes a move, the person on the receiving end is in a tight corner, to say the least. I mean, do they claim for inappropriate misconduct with HR and risk losing their job? Or do they lean into it and see if there's some possible benefits from having a relationship, even a friendship, with someone who very likely has more status and money and power than they do? Now, in a workplace boss-employee dynamic, money is inherently part of the decision making by each party involved particularly the person at the bottom of the ladder it may not seem that way but it is because any decision that the person at the bottom of the ladder makes can impact their income i.e they could potentially lose their job should they reject or even advance the circumstances or they could be part of a lawsuit or potentially get a promotion what i'm saying is a workplace romance between a boss and employee isn't a normal romance It's fundamentally business. Now, what we see in the film is that Mia is the one definitely instigating the sexual tones of every conversation. She's the one who raises her eyebrows. She's the one who suggestively opens her legs. She's the one that talks about doing dark deeds in the dark corners of the Christmas party. But Harry doesn't uphold any professional boundaries by shutting them down. And as such, Mia sees her power rising. She can say and do things other people in the office can't which is exciting and attractive in of itself, only fueling her desire to make it a more permanent and potentially official through an actual affair. So dressed up as the devil at a Christmas party, which makes no sense because it's a Christmas party, not a Halloween one. Anyway, Mia and Harry dance very intimately together in front of his wife, Karen, who watches them from a distance and obviously sparks Karen's suspicions. When out Christmas shopping with Karen, Harry buys an elaborate piece of jewellery for Mia. Or, well, he tries to buy it, but Rowan Atkinson, our icon, kind of enters the picture as Rufus, a jewellery clerk who buffles the plan, as it were. But later, Harry goes out, revisits the shop, and buys the necklace. Karen then finds the necklace at a later date in Harry's pocket. But when she doesn't receive it for Christmas, instead of receiving a CD in a box that was very similar to the necklace box, she learns of the affair. And once again, peak Thompson acting here. It's perfect performance, can't fault it. She does a brilliant job in expressing her heartbreak at this and then emotionally switching back onto mother face. On a complete side note, can we just talk about how 
freaking ugly this necklace is. It is the ugliest necklace I have ever seen. In fact, if I were Karen and I found that my husband had bought an affair partner that necklace, I would have not felt threatened in the slightest. I thought, well, you know what? Neither of them have any taste, do they really? I, she can have that. She can have him. What the actual hell? Now, going back to the Christmas party, the decision to dress Mia up as a devil at this Christmas party is a cartoonish attempt to put full blame on Mia and literally demonise her. And we get it, the woman is a nasty piece of work. We don't like her. But this is giving me Clinton and Lewinsky narrative vibes. You know, when the public demonised the woman, called her a witch, a homewrecker, a slut, a whore. And yes, the man lost his job, but he suddenly didn't fall into ruin like his young intern. The blame was put on the temptress for pulling him away from his career and his wife, despite he being the one with more power. He being the married man who took an oath to his woman. He who promised to be faithful. He who was responsible for setting boundaries to, with his employees and members of staff and other women. But Clinton, like Harry, is not called a slut or a whore or a homewrecker. The cheating men are not dressed up as little devils or given seductive scenes to demonstrate their promiscuity. They're just poor men, led astray and being a bit foolish. The whorish nature of Mia is further emphasised by two separate scenes in the film of her in her underwear, alone in her bedroom. One time she is just stripping herself off, and another time she is sitting before the camera as though she was sitting in front of a mirror, wearing just a necklace in her underwear that obviously Harry got for her. Now, the confrontation between Karen and Harry is one of the classiest things I've ever seen on screen and very Emma Thompson in style, shall we say. You know, she approaches Harry very casually, asking what he would do in her position, asking if he'd stay with her if she were in his shoes, if, she fa if he found out she'd bought expensive jewellery for another person. But then her emotional switching is absolutely marvellous. Her children come into scene and she becomes mother again. But unfortunately, this becomes one of the worst stories of all. Because from what we see in the film, Karen stays with Harry, the guy who took her for granted and had an affair. Well, I suppose that's because love conquers all, right? Or in this case, love conquers all women with such low self-esteem and self-worth that she doesn't think she can do any better. Ah, Mark. The biggest creep of the entire film and yet has become known as the most iconic romantic character, if not the icon of the film. We all know the placard scene, even if you haven't seen the film. So let's talk about Mark, let's talk about creep number one. We are introduced to him straight off the bat, of him standing at the top of the aisle with his best friend, Peter, who, with who, for whom he is the best man. And Peter is marrying 18 year old Kira Knightley at the time, and the actors who play Mark and Peter are 30 years old and 26 respectively may not be indicative of a an age difference within the plot line, but it is a relevant detail, as we will find out later, in terms of other stories. Anyway, so the introductory conversation about Mark and Peter tells us everything we need to know about Mark. In the opening lines, we learn that Mark hired Brazilian prostitutes for Peter's stag do against Peter's will. So right off the bat, we're dealing with a top class ass who doesn't respect the relationship boundaries, or his friend's relationship at all, or his friend's boundaries. So that says everything really, doesn't it? Then, throughout the rest of the wedding day, he is seen uh, intently filming the bride and groom. So much so that it attracts the attention of another guest who asks him quite bluntly if he's in love with Peter. <laughs> no, no, he's not in love with Peter. He's in love with his wife, who he's never spoken to, yet spends the entire wedding day filming solely, up close, for what I can only assume is for his personal wank bank. His focus footage on Juliet only comes to light when she phones him and asks to see the footage for herself after her wedding video comes out looking too blue. I mean, literally, the, the dress looks blue on camera, apparently. So when she comes round to his flat to see the footage, she learns it's entirely of her. Close-ups of her face, her hands, her body, her features, her smile, everything. Now, instead of being thoroughly creeped out, he leaves the scene, and then later on in the film, she actually remains receptive to Mark, turning up at her door on Christmas Eve night, and she keeps his present secret from her husband. You know, he asks who's at the door, she says, oh, it's Carol Singer's love. Okay. During the scene, we have the 
iconic placard where he tells her that to me you are perfect, blah blah blah, confesses his love to her in the silence. Now again, rather than being creeped out by a stalkerish, shoddy best friend to her husband who obsessively filmed her and then actually admitted to have ignored her in person every time they've met and known each other for the past few years to the point that she thought that he actually hated her, Juliet is kind of won over and she runs into the street and kisses him, cheating on her husband within less than a month of marriage. Honestly, the pair kind of deserve each other, but Peter never knows the wiser. Peter is completely ignorant, Mark remains his friend, and Juliet remains married to Peter, and they just pretend like nothing ever happened. It's weird and creepy, I don't like it. So who do I have to screw around here to get a cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit? The Prime Minister hilariously asks as his new assistant Natalie enters the room, wheeling in a tray of tea. Way, it's funny because it's playful misogyny foreshadowing a romantic relationship that's in no way violating workplace power dynamics that's worthy of a Clinton and Lewinsky plotline. Well, at least David, unlike Clinton, is one of the very few men in this story who isn't married already. So David and Natalie, like Mia and Harry, is another example of a concerning and not at all romantic power dynamic, though their romance, unlike Harry and Mia's, is celebrated because it lacks the infidelity element. Though, despite not causing traumatic heartbreak in an innocent party as Harry does to Karen, David and Natalie's romance is not the cute office romance that we see play out in a story of Sarah and Carl, because it never can be. There's a power imbalance here that is far too insidious to be romanticised. I mean, whilst we in Britain see the role of Prime Minister as an absolute farce anyway, we still have to acknowledge that there is inherent power in holding that position, more so than there is in any regular employee-employer dynamic. I mean, the man is in charge of the United Kingdom, he's a world leader, he's no casual company director as Harry is with his secretary. And as we've already discussed how the power dynamic is concerning in that dynamic, it's even more concerning in this story. Now, whilst you may be listening to this and think that the notion that bosses and politicians holding power over those not on the same social level as they are sounds like a bit of a stretch, uh, let me transform the circumstances of the power dynamic in a way that's easier to comprehend. The difference between celebrities and non-celebrities. So imagine you were approached by a member of your favourite band, your favourite celebrity or actor or influencer, and they made a bit of a move on you. They become suggestive or even flirty, may even ask for your number. Now the sway this celebrity has over you would extend beyond a natural connection, because you're in a dynamic in which you already held them in admiration and potential affection for them long before they even knew you existed. And with their status and fame comes wealth and notoriety, and that in itself is a powerful force for attraction. And yes, whether you want to admit that to yourself or not, that socioeconomic difference is part of your attraction for them. I mean, for starters, you wouldn't even know they existed if, did they not have it. And how you would react to their advances is very different from how you would respond to the advances of a random person on the street despite the celebrity and the random person on the street being equal strangers to you. You don't know either of them, but the parasocial relationship that you have with one of them and their socioeconomic status gives you a false sense of intimacy and security with the celebrity. I mean, we all know that pretty privilege is a thing. Research has shown that people feel safer and even feel more at ease trusting a conventionally attractive person over someone who is not. But I can promise you now that Boris Johnson didn't pull a woman 20 years his junior because of a banging personality and washboard abs, because it's a fact on Wikipedia that he has neither. Trust me, you don't have to look that up. That's certainly a, a thing that's on Wikipedia. No, Boris Johnson pulled a woman 20 years his junior because of his political power and wealth. To Natalie, David is a celebrity. She admits in the film that she was rooting for him in the election. She must have read about him, watched his speeches, and suggestively even voted for him with that sentiment. She is, in a sense, a fan of his long before she was his employee, which adds an extra degree of sketchiness to this power dynamic relationship. And ironically, there is an acknowledgement of power dynamics being an issue in this circumstance, but we see it not with Natalie and David, but with Natalie and the President of the United States, whom I'll call POTUS from here on. 
You see, Natalie is constantly subjected to misogynistic commentary from men in power behind her back, which David partakes in. He never once stands up for her in front of people in power. In fact, he doesn't even stand up for her when colleagues of hers belittle her. That's how weak he is. Now, POTUS refers to Natalie as a, quote, pretty little son of a bitch with great pipes to David. And later that day, David walks in on him kissing Natalie. In a very clear echo of the Clinton and Lewinsky dynamic, David is positioned as the greater alternative, the good guy, because POTUS is a married man, whereas David isn't. But in reality, the only difference between him and the president is that he's not married. And the power dynamic in play is no different, only in that Natalie is a fan of David's, she wasn't a fan of POTUS. Fellow staff members bully Natalie. She's called chubby by other women to David's face and David says nothing, he never once defends her or stands up for her at all. Instead, overcome for his complex feelings for her, he asks her to be moved from her position like a chess piece at his disposal. Despite him removing her from her position without directly telling her himself, Natalie writes to him in a Christmas card in which she apologises to him for kissing the president and confesses her love to it, and confesses her love for him, saying that she is always his. Imagine telling your boss, a world leader, that you're his possession in the context of apologising for kissing another world leader. It's it's incredibly gross and demeaning. Natalie writes to him not from a place of intimate connection, but as one would an idol. And David lunges at the opportunity to show up at her door and confess his love back. But what's sad is that Natalie has been aware of the power dynamics at play between her and POTUS, but she's not aware of the more subtle one taking place between her and the Prime Minister. And there are many factors at play causing this cognitive dissonance. I mean, f one, she likes the Prime Minister. They're the same age range, and he's unmarried. Oh wait, are they the same age range? Wait, no, <laughs> we'll get back to that. But at the end of the day, the professional and socio-economic dynamic between the pair is no different than that between the President of the United States and she. Now, whilst Natalie gets her happy ending, I can't help but feel that she was a naive young woman taken advantage of, which is somewhat confirmed when Natalie and David bump into Karen, who just so happens to be David's sister. The three meet backstage at a school which is putting on a local nativity play. And when David introduces Karen to Natalie, he says, oh, this is my catering manager. Karen raises her eyebrows and says, quote, watch that he keeps his hands off you. 20 years ago, you would have been just his type. No, seriously. <laughs> Hilarious joke about being taken advantage of with a hint and ominous warning at the end there. What joy. But wait, 20 years ago? Oh, hold on, how old is... Ah, <laughs> funny. So the actress playing Natalie uh, at the time of the recording was 27 years old, uh, whilst Hugh Grant playing David was 43. Fantastic! As if the film needed more uncomfortable power dynamics to play. We already had the teenage Kieran Knightley marrying a man at 26 and then also being flooded on by a man who was 30, which isn't written in the script, but this one certainly is written in the script and it is not the only age difference which is written in the script explicitly. Fantastic. I've never felt more uncomfortable. <sighs> Finally, this story ends with them being found out making out behind the curtain, which is unveiled in front of everyone. It's cringe. I've never felt more uncomfortable watching a film in my life. Kill me now. So as I've already mentioned, Daniel is a newly widowed man and he is now the sole carer for his stepson, Sam, who is refusing to speak to him and has concealed himself in his room. And that's why he's talking to Karen about it. He's worried because obviously devastated by the loss of his wife and concerned that Samuel is spiraling from having just buried his mother literally days before, Daniel decides to take Sam out and sits him on a bench, hoping to connect with the small child in his grief. But spoiler alert, he's not actually bothered by his mother at all. The lad isn't grieving. He reassures Daniel that he's in love. Well, thank God he's not mourning his mother. What a relief. Sam is confused by Daniel's relief. When Daniel expresses that he was concerned it was something much worse, Sam asks him, what? Worse than the total agony of being in love? Well, yes. Like the sudden tragic death of your mother, you little shit. On a complete side note, when I was looking at pictures for the actors for this film, I came across recent photographs of Thomas Brode, songster who plays Sam. And somehow this man is older than me and yet has the same face that he had as a teenager. And I cannot understand this magic. He still looks like a wee lad and I refuse to accept that he's in his thirties and engaged to be married. But anyway, 
Sam is in love with a girl called Joanne and he learns that Joanne, who is an American, is going back to America for some reason. She comes back at the end of the film. I don't really understand why he's so bloody obsessed with her going back to America. It looks like she was just going back to America for Christmas, but okay. A lot of drama over absolutely F all. So in an attempt to win her heart over, he learns to play the drums. And of course, he doesn't get a chance to tell her that he loves her before she leaves for the airport. So his stepfather decides to drive Sam to the airport to chase her down. This is so deeply uncomfortable. Like, this is so unnecessary. This is so dramatic for no apparent reason. Why is this film doing this to me? So then Sam gets to the airport and then barges through airport security in a way that would probably very likely set up a terrorist attack alert in the entire airport, all for a fleeting moment with a girl who kisses him on the cheek. And let's face it, he's got no future with her. He is punching above his weight. There's no chance here. Ha, huh, so Jamie, played by our gorgeous Colin Firth, is a married man who quickly transpires at the beginning of his story, uh, his wife is shagging his brother. So devastated, Jamie retreats to the French countryside with his typewriter for company to write a true crime novel from what we can gather. And there he meets a cleaner or someone working in the house, like a personal assistant called Aurelia, who doesn't speak much French or English and who he quickly learns from the very first conversation is 10 years too young to understand his references. Excellent start, nothing inappropriate about that. I'm starting to see a consistent theme here, Curtis. I mean, thankfully the actress was actually older than Colin Firth at the time. So at least the age difference here is a scripted plot detail and nothing more. Don't know why it's necessary, really, do you? There's a lot of age differences here. Anyway, so though the pair can't actually hold a conversation in the slightest, they bond over the book that he's writing after the pages fly out into the lake and the two of them strip themselves down into their underwear to go and save the pages, which is a fruitless endeavour because that's not how wet paper works, is it? Particularly with a typewriter. But as Ursula says, she has her looks, her pretty face, and never underestimate the power of body language. So after Jamie returns home, the two of them kiss at the airport. He leaves, realises he's in love with her, and he spends the next few days, if not a week or two, learning Portuguese. And then on Christmas Eve, he turns up at his family's home and then ditches them at the door, leaving his family totally devastated to fly to Portugal to spend Christmas Day with a woman that he's never had a full conversation with. Of course, he shows up at her house, completely unannounced and uninvited on Christmas Eve, now speaking enough conversational Portuguese to invite himself into her family home and ask her to marry him. Marry him? Dude, your divorce isn't finalised. In fact, it probably hasn't even been filed. Your wife was only shagging your brother just, like, what, five weeks ago? And you have never had a conversation with this woman. You don't even know her favourite colour. What are you doing? This is so unhealthy. You need to go to therapy. Talk out your trauma with a professional. And not jump at the first woman who lets you talk excessively without interruption because she doesn't understand what you're saying because she can't speak your language. So one of the very rare wholesome storylines in this film is that of Sarah's, though it is unfortunately introduced by another blatant example of workplace misconduct by her boss Harry. Don't we love Harry? So at the beginning of the film, Harry calls Sarah into his office for a one-on-one -on -one meeting to ask her how long she's been in love with Carl, one of his other employees. After finding out she's been in love with him for a while, he encourages her to go out for a drink with Carl and, and I quote, casually drop into conversation the fact that you'd like to marry him and have lots of sex and babies. Let me emphasise this again, that for the people at the back, that Harry and Sarah are in no way related. He is the director of the company she works for and he is her boss. This scene is just downright invasive and creepy. As someone who has had bosses and managers who have asked inappropriate questions about my romance life, I'd like to remind people that employers shouldn't be talking to their staff in an office environment under the guise of a meeting about their personal lives, particularly sexual and romantic ones, unless they had a genuine concern that an in-office romance was impacting the company in some way through a conflict of interest, poor work performance, etc. This is neither of these things. Harry just can't keep his nose out of it, which gives me the impression that he may have led Mia on before the film started. Because if he's casually talking about sex and romance with all of his employees, I don't doubt he flirted with Mia. Anyway... Carl and Sarah's dynamic is one of the most organic and realistic of the very few and far between good romance stories in this film. So after harbouring feelings for one another for a while, the two slow dance to Chris's party and then they kiss after he drives her home. It's very sweet. And this leads to what I would argue is 
actually the most iconic part of the film, which is the silent squeal in the doorway after she's kissed him. But then, as they're getting down to being rumpy-pumpy, uh, her phone goes off, and she chooses to answer it. And it's her unwell brother, who unfortunately is in some form of psychiatric hospital. After that phone call, the two of them cease being intimate with each other, and she chooses to go to see her brother at the hospital. And it puts her love life on hold. But not just for the night. Sadly, permanently. By the end of the film, Carl and Sarah never get together. The last scene we see of them together is her working late in the office on Christmas Eve and Carl standing there looking at her longingly, wishes her a Merry Christmas. She returns it and then he leaves. Sarah is left alone, she cries to herself and then gives her brother at the hospital a call. And that's the end of Sarah's story. Out of the two romances I was rooting for, that was one of them and it was brutalised where others, far less deserving, had a happy ending. I'm looking at you Sam, you little shit. So a funny weird little side tangent is Colin, our hopeless sex pest of the film, who is a waiter working for events catering alongside his friend Tony. Now during the wedding of Peter and Juliet, Colin has an epiphany. He can't find love because British girls are stuck up, he says to Tony, which if we're using me as an example, he's not wrong there. So adamant that hot American women will fawn over his British accent, he books himself a ticket to Wisconsin for a few months. Now, it's a very short story, Colin isn't in the film much, but when he arrives, Colin is naturally swarmed by gorgeous American women who adore his accent, as he predicted. They welcome him into their home, uh, to sleep on the sofa with them, all but naked, leading to an inevitable orgy. Three months later, he returns with two girls. One he's dating, and the other is for his friend, Tony. And she immediately kisses Tony at the airport upon seeing him because I love it. Yeah, there's nothing that says true love more than bringing back some living souvenir sex toys from America, right? Why am I starting to feel like this is actually how Andrew Tate may have started? Okay, so let's end this on a high note. By far the best storyline of the movie is the adorably chatty body doubles who spend their working hours dry humping each other for sex scenes in films, during which time they discuss everything mundane from the general election to traffic on the motorway, etc. Now, these two, in my opinion, deserve their own movie, and I've always been tempted to write an entire novel about such a pairing, because everything about this plotline is the most organic and, ironically, the least creepy out of all the adult romance storylines in this film. I mean, for starters, the degree of consideration and consent between the two is honestly heartwarming. You know, while simulating giving him a blowjob, both stark naked, John sweetly apologises in advance for potentially being too forward before asking Judy out for a Christmas drink, insisting that there's nothing implied further in his offer and insisting also that she doesn't have to say yes if she doesn't want to. 10 out of a 10, adorable demonstration of consideration and consent in the strangest of circumstances, which yet again wins my vote for the best couple of the film. The two were robbed, robbed I say, of deserved screen time. Even sweeter, he drops her off home after their little Christmas date and they leave with a kiss which she initiates and he walks home, letting her shut the door. Genuinely, a film with just those two would have been everything. Curtis's greatest missed opportunity was that final plot line right there. And yes, that is my unhinged rant about Love Actually. Thank you for sitting here for goodness knows how long. I know everyone's going to disagree with me, but I don't care. It's off my chest. That's all I wanted it to be. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this, please leave any recommendations down below. I don't normally watch films. I had to rewatch that purely for this episode, purely for this video. I can't believe I had to see it all over again. And you know, it was just as bad as I remember. Just as bad. I have no regrets. Absolutely no regrets. If you like this video, please consider liking it. If you enjoy this kind of content, which is just chatty ramblies, let me know down below and consider subscribing if you're interested. And I hope we'll see you soon for another video with my wee dogs. And remember, be happy and healthy, and books save lives, so keep reading.